has been one of the great surgeons network, the Asian Solidarity okay. Network, has been one of the greatest professional opportunities in my lifetime. Um, and we're going to jump right in our uh, our evening. We have we have until eight forty five to go. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to give some uh, brief introductions, and then I'm going to lead uh, to some questions, and then we're hoping to have a very engaging.
a really difficult set of topics, but really important ones. Um, yes, often, often I hear uh, Catholics when I, when I mention something about the church and its slavery say, "Well, that was the past. Everybody was, everybody, you know, was involved in slavery then. Nobody knew it was wrong, you know." And then sometimes they'll start talking about like, "Well." And other religions, they did it worse, you know. And they, I mean, there's not a lot of evidence for that. Um, but, but uh, yeah, in my, in my own research, in my own look at this history, uh, I actually found that uh, it's just not true that nobody knew it was wrong back then. Uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, in, in one of his texts, writes about people who say that slavery is wrong. Aristotle, right? There was an early Christian theologian, St. Gregory of Nyssa, who puts together a full theology of what makes slavery wrong in the eyes of Christ. And some of those ideas in St. Gregory of Nyssa's work will show up later in the speeches of Frederick Douglass, in the speeches of Sojourner in Truth. Um, so, so we can't say nobody knew it was wrong back then. Uh, and especially, especially when we get to the era of the African slave trade, we have to, we have to see together um, some very, very painful, difficult truths that, uh, as tough as it might be for us to recognize, the Pope's of the 15th and early 16th century gave full approval for Portugal basically to have free reign on the African continent, to take any lands they wanted to take as long as they weren't being run by uh, Christians, and to both capture and enslave people and purchase people who were enslaved. And that was the beginning of the slave trade. That was approved by four popes from 1452 to 1514. That was the beginning of the slave trade. It lasted nearly 400 years before the Catholic Church would finally issue its first public nomination of the trade, of the trade, the international trade, in 1839, and would not condemn slavery itself until Pope Leo XIII in 1888. During that time, 12.5 million African men, women, and children made in God's image were forced onto ships, herded onto ships, to be forcibly transported across the Atlantic. Only 10.7 of them survived the journey. 10.7 million of them survived the journey. And then, of course, because Catholic canon law and uh, the Catholic theological tradition allowed for slaveholding. It also said, it also said that the condition of the mother passes down to her children. In other words, if you were born to an enslaved woman, you were considered an enslaved person as well. So millions, millions of the descendants of those 12.5 million people became enslaved as well. It's a very painful thing to imagine our church being okay with this. But priests, bishops, uh, popes participated in slaveholding, even though we also have evidence from the very beginning that enslaved black Catholics were resisting this, that they were, uh, that they were petitioning Rome, especially in the 17th century, to condemn the slave trade. Unfortunately, the pope at the time uh, Blessed Innocent XI did not do that. But there were revolts. There were all kinds of things that showed that enslaved black Catholics uh, were protesting their enslavement and that they envisioned an idea of Catholicism that saw that this was wrong. Um, it's a very tough thing to admit uh, and, to, and to recognize and to look at, but it's something that we really need to, uh, to pay attention to, as hard as it is. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Father Kellerman, I want to go a little bit more um, uh, with that framing that you set up for, for us, because 
there is this um, both need and um, perhaps cognitive dissonance that we have when you're presented with the truth and you yet you still kind of make up information and sometimes they're called yeah. myths yeah. you know um, all cult cultures have myths you know mm -hmm. um, um, it's just part of, of, of the, the human condition and myths are actually sometimes fun um, and sometimes they're helpful uh, but sometimes they're quite harmful and so in your book um, part of I think what you uh, when I read through it um, I got a sense that you were also attempting to help people help young Catholics, help young non-Catholics, um, anybody that was uh, interested in learning more today to deal with those common myths um, that uh, may be in the culture of their family, perhaps in their parish, in their communities that they've been taught to believe. Um, just a little bit earlier, Father Massingale was talking about uh, an engagement he had with one of the students that he had in his class. Um, you know, these kind of uh, wrongs um, that were taught as rights. Um, um, and that we continue to tell ourselves and teach our children. Mm -hmm. And so some of those things um, um, might be, um, but what about the slaveholders that were nice? Yeah. You know how Hollywood likes that. Yeah. There's yeah. always got to be a redeeming, you know, character yeah. in movies yeah. and in series, you know, um, or, well, the, that certain pope never sponsored the Atlantic slave trade, and, but, and this other pope was against it, or, People talk about slavery and they think things are different um, because it was a different time, so they contextualize it. Or they just want to believe that the Catholic Church uh, fundamentally has to always be good because it is God's church. Yeah. So how do you kind of help folks? How do we use the, like the, the research that you have in your book, which is really dealing with some of the, slave, the, the history of the Catholic Church and slavery and abolition, to help us in 2023 and going forward to kind of push through and actually bust those common myths that, that um, oftentimes make us feel that you know, we're okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for, for that question. I think that... Um, you know, this idea of sort of creating these myths, it's been happening for a really long time. It's been happening for a really long time. Um, there was a whole idea in the, in the civil law of Rome that then the Catholic Church kind of took over of how somebody could become enslaved. Well, the Atlantic slave trade starts. It starts operating. And some people start saying, hold on a minute. This isn't going like slavery used to go like people are being shipped these really long distances they're being separated from their families um you know they're there and and this there seems to be this kind of weird thing happening in the americas where where there's like a racial hierarchy what is this and so unfortunately jesuit theologians jesuit theologians start making up reasons in their theological tracks to explain well, yeah, but the standards are different when it comes to Africans. And the things that they make up, uh, I dug more deeply into the research, thought, oh, was this just a common belief at that time? Everything had be, been debunked at that time by other scholars. The idea that, and these are horrible things, these are horrible things that these Jesuit theologians would say, that, that, that God had, had, cursed, had cursed Africans with black skin, uh, as descendants of Canaan. Um, there were already people at that time saying, no, that's crazy, read the Bible. This, isn't, this doesn't make any sense, right? There were people that would say things like, well, um, these, are, these are people who um, Aristotle would have described as natural born slaves, right? At the time, at the time, there were already people saying, no, that's just made up. And there was this great, there was this great uh, Capuchin priest in the 1680s who said, the only reason why these racist theories are made up is because Europeans want to keep enslaving black people. Right? Okay, so the Society of Jesus was one of the largest, maybe the largest corporate slaveholder in the Americas. 
We know about the Georgetown 272. We heard um, Monique's beautiful talk. But in the year 1760, the Society of Jesus throughout the world owned over 20,000 enslaved people. Over 20,000. So why do I bring that up? Because part of the myth that needs to be busted for those of us who love the Ignatian tradition, the Jesuit tradition, is that our tradition was one of the, the worst actors in this. And the Jesuits would often hold up Peter Claver and say, oh, but look, look, we minister to the enslaved people through Peter Claver. He's a great saint, et cetera, et cetera. Peter Claver participated in the trade himself. He gave money to slave traders and asked them to go back to Africa and buy him some people that would serve as his interpreters, right? But the Society of Jesus lifted him up so that the Jesuits could look like that we were the heroes. It's an extremely sad and extremely painful story. However, um, when we look at these enslaved Catholics that were fighting back and that were seeing intrinsically that this was not God's will for them, that's when we find hope. That's when we find hope because we might think, oh my gosh, the church, it was so messy, it was so horrible. How could we have done this? They were the church too. They were the church too and the Holy Spirit was working within them and inspiring them. Amen. So I want to trans transition um, now to uh, Father Massengill. If you, uh, for the students uh, that are here that haven't heard this, there's an essential reading um, for every student um, in Catholic education, Jesuit education, and it is entitled Racial Justice and the Catholic Church. So students that are taking notes, write that down right now. Father Massengill, Brian Massengill is the author. It was published in 2010. You can find it wherever books are sold. Um, <laughs> it's essential reading um, because over the last 20 years, and I have followed him personally over the last 15, um, he has moved the church through his writings and his lectures. So he's been lecturing about these issues for a long time towards what um, he calls, even in his book, a more adequate engagement on racial injustice. And in that body of work, the book is, is a culminating piece, but the lectures further accompany it, um, lays a foundation for us, those of us that want to do this work of justice, for, that is more nuanced, as he often uh, says, and as we know, is much more honest discussion on uh, racial reconciliation. So Father Massengale, um, I want to take you over these kind of last 15, 20 years that you've been doing this work. How is the church responding to racism internally and in, uh, internally in society today? What is the church getting right? And where do we still need to do this work of racial reconciliation? Wow. Hi, y'all. You get the easy part. You get to talk about history and the past, and everybody can say, oh, that was so bad then, but you know, we're in a better place now, aren't we? And I want to say we're not, unfortunately. We're just not. Um, before I get to your wonderful questions, why is it important that we understand the history that Chris has pointed out for us? We need to understand it because everyone would think that slavery, that was so long ago. The teacher in me is going to come out now. If you take the history of African Americans in the United States, and you start at 1619, and you go to 2023, 1619 was when the first Africans arrived in what we now call the United States. From 16, and this is a ruler that's 12 inches long. The first six and a half inches of the ruler are the period of enslavement. The next half inch is a period we call reconstruction. The next two inches is Jim Crow segregation. The period from the end of Jim Crow segregation, 1968 till now, 
is only an inch and a quarter of the ruler. Why is that history so important? It's important because we have a whole lot of history and a whole lot of experience and it's so deeply rooted this conviction that people of color and African Americans in particular are not human beings. So as a society, as a church, we're skating on ice that's only an inch and a quarter thick. Now I grew up in the Midwest yeah. And I was a Boy Scout for all three months because we had to do winter camping. I said, that's crazy. Out in a tent, in the cold, in Wisconsin, in the winter, 20 degrees below zero. You get the picture. Now, why am I telling you that story? because we had to learn a rhyme in the Boy Scouts about when it was safe to go out on the ice. And the rhyme went like this. One inch keep off. Two inches small groups. No, two inches one may. Three inches small groups. Four inches okay. It's only when the ice is four inches thick that it's safe. If you go out when it's only one inch thick, it's not thick enough and you're going to fall through. As a society, as a church, we are all skating on ice that's only an inch thick. And so we can't be surprised when it cracks and all the past ugliness rushes to the surface. I tell you that because it answers your question in terms of what has the Catholic Church gotten right? The Catholic Church has gotten right the fact that there are black Catholics, Native American Catholics, and growing numbers of Latinx Catholics that are discovering our voices and are continuing to tell the story that the, that the enslaved black Catholics told, that we're continuing to keep our church honest and continuing to tell the story. That's what was getting right. We're creating more and more space for that story to be told. We're claiming the space for that story to be told. Where the Catholic Church is getting wrong, is that our voices are still not heard. That in many places in the United States and in too many of our Catholic schools, we are not willing to teach truthful history, even in our Catholic institutions. And when we do, it's somehow optional or extra credit but it doesn't really impact the story that's being told. What are we getting wrong? I said this before, I'll say this because this is a different group here. The Catholic Church's greatest failing when it comes to dealing with race and racial justice is that we will only deal with the issue in ways that will not disturb the comfort of white people. Let me say that again. We will only deal with the issue in ways that won't make white people uncomfortable. There are Catholic schools that have dis won't invite me to speak because as one person said, we, you need to say something effective. You can't make people uncomfortable. I think, which people are we talking about? <laughs> We still have priests who do not know how to preach and teach a message of re racial reconciliation. Every survey that has been done on this issue has shown that most Catholics will say they have never heard a homily where the priest has talked about racism as a challenge to the gospel. I asked my own students, I said, in your house of worship, whether it's a synagogue, a mosque, or a church, have you ever heard your minister mention racism as a sin against the gospel? And every time, it's only a minority of hands. Most Catholics, and we have evidence for this, during the summer of 2020 when Black Lives Matter protests were going on around the country, 
the vast majority of Catholics never heard a homily that mentioned Black Lives Matter. And more to the point, when they heard a homily that mentioned Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, they heard it described as being a communist movement that must be opposed by Catholics. So that's where we're at, sadly. But, you know, we need to keep this issue alive because as we move into a presidential election season, it's only going to become more and more important. And this is the issue, frankly, that could end our American democracy. But we'll talk more about that later. So I wanna talk um, a little bit about reparations. Um, and um, Father Massingale, uh, this is for you. The definition, this is for our students, the definition of reparations is the making of amends for a wrong that has been done. And you can do it by paying money uh, or, uh, or to or otherwise helping those who have been wronged and other uh, supportive resources. People today also tend to believe that the concept of reparations is new. Um, in Kellerman's, uh, Re uh, Reverend Kellerman's research, he discusses a document written by an excommunicated priest in 1682 who wrote about reparations. Um, and this, uh, this priest talked about how um, land needed to be returned to the descendants of those that had been actually slaves themselves in order for, their, for reconciliation to take place. So rooted in the gospel, Father Massengale, how should the Catholic Church think about and consider reparations in the context of this history um, and their role in slavery? I like the way you began by talking about reparations and what it means. It means making whole, mm -hmm. repairing the damage that's been done. That's what reparation is all about. And this is not a foreign concept. Your history shows us that this is deeply traditional and it's deeply Catholic. Even embedded in our Catholic sacramental system, the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation, the part of it, it begins with this examination of conscience, contrition, this confession, and then there's what we call this purpose of amendment where you make an effort to repair the damage that's been done. And in traditional Catholic teaching, for example, you could not be forgiven of your sin if you didn't make things right. So for example, if you stole something, you had to return what you stole. If you gossiped about someone and hurt their reputation, you had to go out, not just apologize to the person, you had to now put the truth out there and you had to repair the damage that your gossip and your lie caused. This is very traditional. This is not, you know, liberal, progressive, or democratic, whatever that is. No, this is Catholic. Yeah, you got that. Some of you are listening, good. <laughs> and so what do we mean in terms of reparation? I think that we need to seriously, as Catholics, enter into a moment and realize that this idea is only crazy when it comes to black people. We have made reparations to other groups. So for example, the Japanese Americans who were interned in, in concentration camps in World War II, they received an apology and reparations. Jewish citizens in the Holocaust. Germany made reparations. The only group that this becomes controversial with is with African Americans. And that's for two reasons. One is that we don't know the history. <laughs> and so this conversation about reparations seems like it's coming out of nowhere. We need to know our history. And part of the problem, we, I, don't think we're, I don't think we as a society are equipped to talk about African American reparations because we don't even know the basic truth 
about why we're having the conversation and why it's necessary. So first, I think that's, but the other reason why I think reparations are resisted for black Americans in a way that they aren't resisted for the Japanese or weren't resisted for, for, Jewish, for Jewish folks is because an honest conversation would force white people to look at truths they don't want to face. As James Baldwin said, they do not know and they do not want to know. Because for most white people, if they really face the truth of what, ha what's, what happened in our country and is happening in our country, it means they have to take a deep, honest look at people that they know and love. And it means that you have to look at some people that you know and love and come to some really painful realizations about them. And we usually kind of make excuses, saying, oh, well, that was just the way he was raised. Or, you know, that's just the way grandma talks. Or, yeah, that was kind of sketchy, but deep down they're really nice people. But talking about reparations means that we have to take an honest look not only at our society, because that's easy, because we can kind of distance ourselves. It means we have to take an honest look at family and friends, and we have to face some really tough truths about them. And it means that we have to face the fact that before we even talk about reparations, are we willing to be truth tellers in our own families? Are we willing to be truth tellers in our own schools? Are we willing to be truth tellers to our friends? And you don't have to give them a learned dissertation. All you have to do is look at them and say, hey, bro, that's not funny. But if we can't fun, come with the courage to do that, then we're not gonna have the courage to do this kind of difficult work of reparation. So I want to transition us towards the kind of final questions. And this question doesn't seem like it's a transition, but it is. I've heard uh, Father Massengale speak on another, a number of occasions, particularly um, when he would come out to uh, uh, San Francisco and speak in campuses there. And, one, and I looked in some of my notes from um, uh, one of the times he was there, and I made a note like a star by it, and I, I pulled this out because it caught my attention so much, and it was something I had heard even in my childhood as a descendant of people that were enslaved, um, where he talked about being rooted in the gospel, um, and he had said that if the, we might move forward, and so this was like part of him wrapping a conversation in San Francisco some years ago, if the church is to move forward, he had said, we must be able to sit in our sinfulness and lament in it. <laughs> and I, I underlined it because that was like kind of his concluding thought um, about how do we move forward. And so in this transition um, uh, moment, I want to kind of come back to that. What does the Catholic Church still need to, to do to sit in our sinfulness and lament for racial justice? You know, that, that idea of sitting in your uh, sinfulness and to uh, lament in it, um, what does that look like today? Um, um, for racial justice, and you may have already gotten to it in some of your uh, responses, but I just wanted to bring in that statement, which stayed with me, and I wanted to bring that in um, today, that that was part of the, of the next step. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought maybe you were gonna go to him first. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lament. That meant means to mourn, to grieve, to feel pain and sadness. Lament means that we hate being in the place where we're at. Because when we lament and mourn and grieve and hate being where we're at, where we're at then we will summon the energy 
to do what it takes to get out of it. But first you need to lament and grieve it. And let me make it very concrete. Um, I had a very dear friend, um, he was a fellow priest, um, his name is Jim, and loved him like a brother. In fact, loved him beyond my brother. <laughs> he knew things about me my brothers didn't know. <laughs> and there was, I, I would trust him with my life and he would trust me with his. In fact, so much so that when he was in his dying days, I was his power of attorney and he trusted me with making that decision to take him off of life support and to let him go on. Jim is white and I'm black. And as much as we loved one another, as much as we trusted each other, as much as we would do anything for each other, there would be times when he just couldn't get what I was saying. He just couldn't get it. And we would just I remember one conversation where we just looked at each other with this kind of pain and incomprehension, and he looked at me and he said, I hate this. I hate that because of who I am and because of how I was raised, I can't hear you. And I said, I hate it too. That's the lament. And it's when you hate it enough, but you're willing, then you're willing to do something about it. And we as a country and as a church have never gotten to the point where we say, I hate it. We have never gotten to the point of saying, I hate that history that Father Kellerman has unearthed. I hate the fact that we only have 100 black Catholic priests in the country in the United States. I'm not talking about the Africans. I'm talking about African Americans. And there are reasons for that. It's not because black folks don't want to be priests or didn't have a vocation. But when we came, the Catholic Church said, no, you can't enter. And I'm going to be really honest, I'm not telling the truth. Okay, I am not a Jesuit. People always want to put SJ after my name. Sorry, no. Um, no, I, I keep telling people I was a real priest, you know, the one in Samoa. <laughs> Whoa. But there's a reason why I'm not a Jesuit. I'm going to tell the true truth here. And I was Jesuit educated, went to Marquette University, University was inducted in Alpha Sigma Nu. Some of y'all know what that is, the National Jesuit Honor Society, because I was that kind of student, okay? And at the initiation ceremony, we were having a dinner afterwards. We're all at you know, tables, and there was a Jesuit at each table. And a Jesuit went around the table and was asking us, well, what were we going to do after we, grad after we graduate? And I said that I was going to go and join the, and go to the diocesan seminary. And he said, well, why aren't you entering the Society of Jesus? And I said, well, Father, I've been here for four years. I've been a daily mass goer. I've been a lector and a Eucharistic minister. I've been leading campus ministry retreats. I'm a philosophy and theology major. I mean, vocation stamped in neon letters across the forehead. And y'all never asked me. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'm sure if you had what it took to be a Jesuit, we would have asked you. When I met with the provincials of, the, of North America and we were talking about the, the cell of the enslaved, I told them there is a through line from the ownership and sale of slaves to how the Jesuits have engaged with African Americans and why there have never been more than 15 African-American Jesuits in the United States. We need to look at this, and the way we get there, we need to sit in that lament. 
we have never reached the point where we said, I hate this. We have never reached the point where we said, I hate the fact that you're not a Jesuit. I hate the fact that someone told you you didn't have what it took to be a Jesuit. I hate the fact that when I go to my church on Sunday, most of the people there look like me, and that's not the church. It's when we get to the point of saying, I hate this, then we'll enter into genuine lament, and then we will have the strength and the passion to make a new beginning. Father Kellerman, finish this phrase. Until the church deals with its history of slavery and colonialism, it can't. Yeah, so, um, Mary and I were having dinner the other night, and, um, Here's, here's, here's a little bit to think about here. We just heard these very powerful words from, from Brian, from Father Massengale, right? And I'm talking right now in particular to the people who look like me, <laughs> okay? It's really easy to walk out of this room and go, wow, that was powerful, or whoa, man, that was tough, and then go back to your daily life. It's really easy to do that. It's much harder to keep sitting with it, to keep sitting with it, to keep learning. It eats at you. It's hard. It makes you question everything, right? It's really tough. However, I suspect that there are some of you in this room who really care about um, LGBT justice issues. I suspect that there are some of you in this room who really care about the role of women in the church that care about um, any of these justice issues where we see people being marginalized, right? When you look at the history, <laughs> all those things are connected. All those things are connected. And um, what I said the other evening to, to Mary and that I firmly believe is that for the church to have for LGBTQ justice to happen in the church, for gender justice to occur in the church, for true justice that includes everyone, <laughs> that brings everyone in, uh, we've got to get through this history of slavery and colonialism because it's all linked. It's all linked. And it is this giant chasm of a history that, and when you, when you sit with this stuff, you start seeing patterns. <laughs> you see that the opposition today in some Catholic environments to, let's say, a Black Lives Matter sign to the idea of critical race theory, you see that this is a same pattern that's been going on for centuries, you know? And if you ask yourself, gosh, well, I wonder if a few hundred years ago, would I have been opposed to slavery? You know, or if I had been around at the time of Dr. King, would I have joined in him? You can ask yourself right now, am I fighting for uh, these things, right? Am I on the side that says, yeah, we got to get rid of this critical race theory stuff? Because there's your answer. It's the same thing. It's been the same thing for centuries, right? Um, We've got to sit with this stuff, and we've got to get through it. I would imagine, you know, we've got this synod going on right now. That's wonderful. What if we had a synod that dealt specifically with racism? What if we had a synod that dealt with the history of slavery and racism and uh, colonialism in the church? 
and we sat with it, and we heard people's stories, and we heard the way that it still impacts them today, that they still live it out, right? Of black students in schools where the, the only image that they see on a wall in a chapel of a dark-skinned person is the devil, right? I've got a good friend who uh, gives talks on Catholic racial justice uh, throughout the United States. She's a Haitian woman. She's been denied communion before in line and afterwards has gone up to the priest and said, why did you deny me communion? And he said, only Catholics can receive. And she said, I was a baptized Catholic. I've grown up Catholic my entire life. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that there were any black Catholics, right? That's a terrible thing to not be seen, right? What about a synod where we do that, <laughs> where we see people, where we listen, where we dig into this history? It's my belief that that will then be the path that could lead us to justice in all those areas that we care about. Um, the church needs intersectionality <laughs> because it, it needs critical race theory, right? Because we were the ones promoting the opposite. As we come to a close, um, I'm just looking across the, um, the, the audience, and the lights are bright, so I'm really able to see the front row. And in the front row, I see uh, an intergenerational mixture of, of people of justice who care about this work. Um, we have an individual who has served as the chair of the Ignatian um, Solidarity Network, who continues to serve as the chairman of one of our great higher education Jesuit institutions. I see doctoral students um, who are studying and committed to these issues of social justice, um, working in a school of education. I see a professors. Um, I see undergraduate students. I see high school students that come from some of the Jesuit prep schools. I see teachers, the secondary teachers. That's just what I see in the front two rows. Basically, everyone here is committed to this idea of a faith that does justice. As we go out today and as we prepare um, for this final message from our sponsor, um, let us be able to be people for others. And part of that is being able to hold dissonance that's in our society that we can hold things that are good and that are not so good, and that we don't have to live in the binary, that it has to be either this or it must be that, but we can be people of both and and, that we can deal with more nuance, that we can deal with complexity, that we can deal with rigor, and that we can deal with tough, and at the same time, we can deal all of those things together brings more love and more hope. I want to thank so much um, these two men um, of faith. Um, I just want to say thank you so much um, to uh, Reverend Kellerman for this book that you have given us to help us understand. Um, and, and, and I think that you reach a different audience in some ways in, 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 uh, in the work that you're doing. And I just want to lift up um, uh, Father Brian for everything that you have done. Um, Father Massengale's work has been a rock, it has been a foundation, and it has been a pillar uh, for all of us to stand on. And I just want to thank you for the work that you continue to do year after year after year. Um, we're just so grateful because you continue to do the uncomfortable and you show up and you do it every day. Let's thank for both of them for being here with us. Before we leave, yes, yes, yes. 